Welcome to the Multi-Benefit Neighborhood Greenway Session. I'm Eileen Aldewenda. I'm the Executive Director of the Council for Watershed Health, and I'm excited to be joined today by Jason Casanova, also known as Cass. He is our Director of Planning and Information at the Council for Watershed Health. We have David Diaz, the Executive Director of Active San Gabriel Valley, fondly known as Active SGV, and James Powell, Senior Design Associate with Alta Planning. We've all been working on a particular greenway that is near and dear to our hearts, Merced Avenue Greenway in the city of South El Monte. And there are a lot of lessons that we've learned over the past few years, and we're excited to share those with you today. So we often think about our projects as having multiple benefits, and this greenway is no different than any others. And when we think about multi-benefit, we think about traffic safety, we think about park space, we think about water quality, and the benefits that come from reducing the urban heat island effect in, in many of our communities that are um, burdened with that. And when we talk about watershed health, at least from our, the Council for Watershed Health's perspective, we know that there are a number of different benefits that align with community priorities, um, such as the ones I've just mentioned. And that's not necessarily the first focus of the projects. Um, for us, we tend to look at water first, but it's been a really interesting and, and valuable experience from our perspective, working with communities to learn about their priorities and see how they can align with water. And so Merced Avenue is one example of how that's been done. When we talk about multi-benefits, we're thinking also about the access of trails and the connection to our communities. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to David, who will tell us a little bit more about the community of South El Monte, the community around Merced Avenue, and how this project has been a community-driven process and one that's, been, that's leading to this wonderful greenway. Um, so my name is David Diaz. I'm the executive director of Active San Gibo Valley. We're a place-based organization in Eastern Los Angeles County, Approximately 2 million people live in Eastern Los Angeles County. Um, we're a very diverse region, uh, primarily Latino mixed with heavy Asian Pacific Islander population um, covering 31 cities and four large unincorporated areas. Our mission is to create a more sustainable, equitable and livable San Gabriel Valley. I'm also very proud to say that most of us grew up including myself as either a volunteer or intern uh, to graduate to full-time staff. Um, so we have a lot of love and dedication to our mission, to the region, to the place that we call home. And in particular, as Eileen mentioned, uh, Merced Avenue is located in the city of South El Monte. I'm a lifelong resident of the cities of El Monte and South El Monte. It's actually where I met my wife, some of my best friends, went to local public schools. And in addition to my role as executive director, I'm also currently serving on the high school board. And one of the reasons that motivated me to do this work or get into this work is because the cities of El Monte and South El Monte are some of the most pollution burdened communities in the entirety of California. They are top 10 disadvantaged communities according to the Cal Enviro screen. So they suffer from high burdens of pollution, high childhood obesity and adult obesity rates, high unemployment rates, low educational attainment. And so our cities due to racist policies um, and system inequities have led to very undesirable outcomes for our community. And so after graduating from college, I was very fortunate to come back and be able to work in these communities. And so now as executive director of Active SGV, I get to work on making a difference in the communities that I grew up in. And that being said, um, as Eileen mentioned at the beginning or at the top, Active SGV was actually started as a simple Facebook page called the West San Gabriel Bicycle Coalition by a group of concern residents in the San Gabriel Valley with respect to the absent uh, public infrastructure to support people walking, biking, and using public transit. Since then, we've grown into, you know, rebranded. Re We're now active San Gabriel Valley, reflecting the intersectionality of our work. But really one of the first things that we did was host a monthly community bike ride where we, uh, it was a free family community bike ride where we went around the Emerald Necklace, uh, two bicycle superhighways that were protected off street from traffic uh, with families to identify challenges in the community, but also opportunities. And so this is one of the first things that we did was this mapping exercise of seeing what cities had existing bike plans, had funding for bike plans, or had no bike plan at all. That initiated for us what we're calling the Regional Bicycle Master Plan that included the cities of El Monte, South El Monte, 
uh, Baldwin Park, San Gabriel, and Monterey Park. So creating regional connectivity in that area. And we really prioritize doing a lot of community engagement, meeting people where they were at, conducting design charrettes, hosting everything from blue ribbon committee to community advisory committee meetings to make sure that the plans were reflective of what the community wanted to see um, in, their, in their neighborhood. And we were also fortunate enough to work with Alta Planning um, at the time when we started this initiative. And so all these uh, bike master plans were successfully adopted in December of 2014. Um, and so since then, we've been working on filling in the gaps in the region, which include another planning effort for an additional five cities uh, to be able to make, sure, to make sure that they also, in addition to bicycle master planning, that they also have active transportation planning, so anything human powered. Um, and one of the key things about the second phase of this, of the regional bicycle master plan, is not only the regional connectivity, but also the focus on the San Gabriel Valley greenways, uh, which for us are these golden opportunities or these, these green opportunities uh, to be able to realize 151 creeks, washes and channels into multi-use paths for families and children to be able to safely traverse the San Gabriel Valley um, to go to their local school, grocery store, library or other destination. Um, because one of the things that I did forget to uplift is that both the communities of Almani and South Almani are very park poor. Uh, Almani has 0.41 acres per 1,000 residents uh, South Almaty is not faring any better. They're also under one acre per a thousand residents. And so we really see the greenways as an opportunity to increase park space, access, recreation for families to be able to thrive in the San Gabriel Valley, also to combat some of the other environmental injustices that people are facing, such as pollution. And so with respect to this plan, we were also able to identify the 50 most feasible miles for construction. Um, and so currently, as a nonprofit organization, we're engaged with, with multiple organizations, Los Angeles County Department of Public Works, LA County Flood Control, the Supervisor's Office, Supervisor District One, uh, to be able to realize these projects, because it's really important that we not only just do the planning, but we also make sure that these agencies are accountable to actually implement some of the things that community wanted to see. And so, you know, over the course of the last couple of years, and most recently, we've been working on making sure that some pieces of this Greenway network are implemented. And so, Last year before COVID, we did community outreach and engagement on the Point of Creek, uh, making sure that this, this already has full funding, making sure that this moves forward, has community support, has community design ideas, um, where people are gonna be able to use it on an ongoing basis. These are just pictures of some of the amenities for the Point of Creek. Uh, we're working right now with another regional bike plan city, which is the city of Baldwin Park, uh, to be able to realize four micro parks because Baldwin Park is actually more park poor then Almani and South Almani. And so they're pairing these four micro parks along with connectivity to the Big Dalton, uh, which again is a greenway that's currently closed, uh, not, not accessible. And we, we, we want this to be open and utilized by the community uh, to address some of the injustices that are going on. I mean, then the project that, you know, we're doing this, a, lot, a lot of time talking about. There's a lot of, uh, in the communities of Almani and South Almani in particular, there's a lot of north-south connectivity. So meaning, you know, we have the Emerald Necklace that goes around. There are gaps in the system where they're not able to traverse them. They're not connected. Basically the Greenway, the Rio Hondo and San Gabriel aren't connected to each other. So people do have to share the road with cars for portions of it. Uh, but there is that north and south ability for people to get around Almani and South Almani. The challenge is that there's not enough east and west connectivity so meaning there's, before our work, there was no existence of any class threes, which are just the shells on the ground, class twos, which is the painted bike lane, sometimes with some type of uh, additional signage or amenities or the class four, the protected bikeway. And so for us, it's really important that we not only create this regional access to the greenways, but also be able to connect people um, east and west to be able to safely access them, right? Because if we're asking people to drive to these respective greenways, that's not really getting to the intent or spirit of what we want to do, which is not have everything be so car centric. Um, and so this is Merced Avenue. Uh, we did a lot of community engagement and outreach on this project. Um, it actually started as a result of a 2010 planning effort or a feasibility study by the city and residents. Our former executive director at the time, Javier Hernandez, was working on that uh, through an agency called CCPHA. 
Um, and so they, they identified Merced Avenue, Rush, Santa Anita as corridors for improvement. We built upon that work in the regional plan efforts under the bike plan uh, for us to be able to get additional, um, additional feedback during the bike plan process. And then in about 2015, 2016, in partnership with the Council for Wildwood Health, we undertook this initiative where we did additional community engagement and planning around community identified priorities. Uh, we then took those community identified priorities to the local city, uh, cities, Almani and South Almani, and it became apparent that there was an opportunity for us to couple some of the, the goals and funding that the city had with some of the goals that the city, that the city residents wanted to achieve. And so we initiated a partnership with the city of South Almani and the Council for Wildwood Health, and we submitted a grant on their behalf, which they'll talk about more a little bit later. Um, and we were successful in getting that funding. And one of the things that was centered in that proposal was to make sure that we had ongoing, iterative, accessible, multi-language uh, community outreach and engagement for folks. And so we did a combination of things. We tabled at various community events. We hosted community information meetings. We hosted a really cool pop-up on Merced Avenue, replicating some of the conditions that you see in the design for people to get a chance to actually experience what that would look like, how traffic would flow. Uh, we also hosted a tour to the city of Santa Ana to see some of these um, uh, low impact developments. So like if you, if you have a traffic circle, but it's also green, uh, if you have wayfinding signage, if you have these curb cuts that are also capturing stormwater uh, for elected officials and also for city commissioners and any other resident that wanted to attend. So we took a bike tour to the city of Santa Ana we also have a multilingual website that's available for folks. And then one of the things that we prioritize tremendously is uh, door knocking. So along this corridor, there are a lot of single fam, well, a lot of multifamily homes, mobile homes. And we knew that the best way to reach them was to door knock. And so we went up and down this corridor at least 10 times, at least 10 times uh, to capture people's input and feedback to make sure that the, the plan and the design was reflective of what they wanted and and what would meet their needs. Uh, because as Eileen uplifted, the urban heat island effect is an issue. Uh, child and adult obesity is an issue. Traffic violence is an issue. Uh, pollution is an issue. And so we're really looking at this multi-benefit approach to be able to address or tackle a lot of the issues that South Amani residents were facing. Um, and so pairing that, you know, just highlight a couple other cool things that we may be done um, here is we also at our campus in the city of El Monte, Amigos de los Rios, a local nonprofit was awarded a CAL FIRE grant. We pitched for them to design a bike skills campus where myself and my colleagues actually went out and chalked this up, the design. Um, and then here you have the San Gabriel Valley Conservation Corps doing some of the work there, but essentially we made a, a bike skills park. And so now it looks like that. So it's just really multiple benefit approach. And you can see kind of on the horizon over here, the real Hondo is actually just over there. Um, and so folks, it's like within a quarter mile uh, for folks to come over to the campus. We also added a pump track element to it. And so children and families are here on, you know, Monday through Friday as well as Saturday experiencing this kind of introduction to mountain biking uh, in a safe environment uh, for folks that can't access the mountains or travel anywhere else. It's really unique. It's the only bike park that's located on a decommissioned school anywhere that we could find in the state of California, maybe in the United States. Um, and so, and then another effort similar to Merced Avenue that we're also working with Alta on is creating another neighborhood greenway um, on Parkway Drive in the neighboring city of El Monte. And so this, this, uh, this effort here will actually connect people to the other side, which is the San Gabriel River safely. Um, and so we're really excited about transforming Parkway Drive into a neighborhood greenway as well. Recently notified that it will get funded at the California ATP level. Um, and so in working in partnership with the Alta team as well as the community, we're really excited to realize this community driven effort as well. Um, and here's a picture of the design example in front of the school where it's actually at Mountain View High School. Um, and so, you know, as part of our outreach and engagement, we made sure to include youth voices. We did an environmental audit or walk audit through Google Maps with them, identifying opportunities and challenges for them, and then reflecting that in the final design. Um, so with that, um, that concludes my presentation. I know I won't be taking questions at this time. So this is just me talking so that James can edit it later. 
Thank you, That's David. Thank that was you. great. It's great. <laughs> that was good. Uh, so, David, don't go away. Come back because I want to. I want to segue here. Um, so, David, I'd like to ask you about you. Uh, and I, we're going to do more. David, I'd like to ask you a, just a question that we can come come back to in the live Q and A. When you're thinking about your projects now, especially this last one. How are you thinking about the water aspect of things now? Because this is a little bit different than what we started off with in, in our partnership and our collaboration kind of focusing in on what the council focuses on, which is sort of looking at that water quality, the flooding um, of the runoff, and then looking at how it gets paired up with other projects, uh, project priorities, like making sure that there's good bikeway connections. And so now I'm wondering sort of what, what have you learned from that process that you're taking into your future projects? Well, I've learned a couple of things in this process, right? MS4 is like a bad word to say to folks, right? Like MS4 compliance is a bad word. Um, I've also learned the name of the game is sink, slow and spread and the importance of capturing water, like where it's actually landing, right? Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is that there isn't sufficient funding in the region to fund all projects. So the importance of coupling uh, funding together. So for folks not familiar or in the LA area, right? We have multiple funding streams that could be paired together. So measure M, that being the transportation sales tax, measure A, which is a parks uh, measure, and then measure W, which is the stormwater. So I think it's now more than ever important to make sure that we're coupling these funding streams together to be able to realize projects like Merced Avenue, like Parkway Drive, like the Greenway Network that we'd like to see accomplished. Um, because at the end of the day, there are so many needs in this community right, including the water and the pollution piece of it and the stormwater capture is that we, we need to be able to couple all these funds together to meet the various needs of the community. So it's not just about the, the sinks low and spread, right, but it's also the economic justice, the environmental justice piece of it, the mitigating the traffic violence that's happening. So we're really looking at this, uh, you know, from a multi-benefit perspective. Well, and thank you, David. And in addition to that multi-benefit perspective, we have to look at multi-benefit funders for these projects too, because we know that there, there are limited funds and all the different types of funding that you mentioned um, are certainly unique to, to our region and others thinking about how they might fund these projects might not have the same resources, but still need to be thinking about those multiple funders. And this is where the council has been working in a number of different ways. And it's a great segue to the work that CAS has been doing as part of not only Merced, but in terms of looking at other, other projects that we're working on, as well as with other community-based organizations and how they might approach their funding for their projects. Because we know, again, that there are limited funds, there, it's highly competitive now, and yet there is a great need. And you know, time and time again, we hear from the funders that they always end up with more proposals and grant, you know, uh, project proposals than they can fund. And they would love to fund many of them, if not all of them. So another, you know, a couple of different approaches are needed. And so Cass, I'm gonna move to you and, and uh, ask you to share sort of what we've learned and what you've learned about the funding of multi-benefit multi projects. And maybe that can lead into some other lessons that we've learned working with community-based organizations that we can take forward into the design aspect of Merced Avenue and other projects. So Cass, can you sure. share a little bit more? Thanks, Eileen. Um, yeah, I would just echo what David said regarding um, looking at those com multiple community benefits and that's kind of where it starts when it comes to funding. Um, focusing on, in on not just a siloed approach where it's just water or it's just transit, um, creating a project that carries across all of these subject areas. We're lucky here in LA because there's a lot of uh, money around water um, and it's not necessarily being taken advantage of um, by communities that don't have the resources or the staffing uh, uh, to go after these larger pots of money. Um, so we've been trying to serve as that sort of conduit to get funding into these communities that really need these transit corridors uh, created. Um, I would say that the partnership is also super important. Uh, the reason why I think Merced has been so successful is because we started off um, focused 
on community first and foremost in having a community-based organization that has built that trust in the community um, is really important in, in the process. And then as we went through identifying needs, the, just the, the fact that we as the nonprofits, us, uh, Active SGV and another non local nonprofit, uh, Climate Resolve, took the initiative to write the grant on behalf of the city, which they were super appreciative of their, you know, they are don't have a, a lot of staff and a lot of capacity to, to do a lot of this grant writing. Um, and also they weren't necessarily um, aware of the, the connection that we had made um, looking at water dollars that were available for a transit project. Um, so in incorporating things like bioswales, in, in incorporating things like bioswales and, and infiltration galleries and, and whatnot, uh, we could take advantage of bringing in some of the, the water dollars as well in these transportation projects. So uh, I think with that, the former said in particular, we had put in a design grant for uh, Merced Avenue to the Coastal Conservancy under this larger green infrastructure umbrella um, that focused in on all of the community benefits plus a water quality, water capture benefit. And the thing that the Coastal Conservancy really highlighted in terms of one of the reasons why we got the award was that partnership with the, the CBOs being a part of the process from the beginning and they're completely integrated into the design process as well. And at that point, that's when we were able to bring on uh, James from Alta and uh, Tetra Tech as well as a, as a full design team. So we covered all the, the aspects of it. Again, there's a lot of different funding pools available, uh, whether it's state dollars through any of the proposition money. Prop 68 is has a lot of different programs that integrate multiple benefit. Um, same with the Strategic Growth Council. In moving into construction now, um, we're also looking at the water funding that's come on board, like with Prop 1. We received three different types of funding for construction. Uh, Proposition 1, Proposition 1 Stormwater Grant, uh, a Prop 68 Green Infrastructure Grant, and another Prop 68 Green Infrastructure Grant through a different agency. On top of that, I think the, the key to stringing these types of projects together is to have private philanthropy involved um, to keep everything connected, especially in the lulls and also at the beginning because there's not a lot of money in engagement in gathering those community needs when you first kick off a project. So having the Water Foundation on board initially you know, they gave us some seed money, us an active SGV to work with the city on coming up with some concepts and ideas. And that ultimately turned into that grant proposal that we submitted on behalf of the city. Um, so that's super important. You know, after that, once you get, you know, some initial private philanthropy, we had Disney come on board as well um, through the design process. So pairing together the state funds, the philanthropy, and also the local funds here in LA County, we're just fortunate to have the measures that David had mentioned. Um, and, and even a new measure, Measure J is coming on board when we talk about stewardship moving forward and workforce development um, once Merced is constructed uh, is gonna be super important. And uh, just an, another item that we can incorporate into our proposals when we're writing these. Thanks, Cass, for kind of covering all the different variables that come into a project, at least from the funding sources. It's kind of really important to make sure that we have that funding through the design and then setting it up to, to be constructed because it doesn't make any sense to do go through a design process and then not being able to implement it in a way that we're, that we're intending for it to happen. You, you know, we, we've touched, we've, we've focused in on the partnership with the community-based organization. There's also the partnership and collaboration with the city. And I'm wondering if you can kind of just touch on that in terms of um, how, how we, you know, what we've learned from that process, especially in line, in, in light of the, the funding opportunities, because often it's the municipalities that are in line to receive those funds. And sometimes it's the CBO and sometimes it's a nonprofit. And so I'm hoping you can kind of touch on um, and kind of set us up for some questions from the audience about how that's worked for us, at least with Merced Avenue, if not for other projects that maybe David can talk to at another point in time. 
Yeah, and I might have David chime in here um, anyway, because this is really based around sort of a trust that they had already built with the city. Um, they worked with the city manager and, and city staff on other issues, so they had that relationship. And David can speak to this. Um, what I've learned is that, you know, when active SGV is out there working in the community and these meetings that they're holding with, with youth and parents, if they can fill a room with those people, you can sure bet that the elected officials are going to recognize that and, and see that uh, strong relationship that they that they carry. And so having that strong partnership with a local community-based organization is super important. By the same token, you know, having a municipality on board is essential because more than likely it's their land that you're working on. Um, and, and you want to have their complete buy-in moving forward. I don't know, David, do you have anything to add on, on that front? Yeah, just uh, to second, you know, or to echo what you said, I think for us, it's, you know, a lot of this work is relational, right? Building relationships with city staff, with elected officials, doing the education piece on why these issues are important. Uh, like I mentioned at the top of my presentation, you know, we're, we're all San Gabriel Valley residents or raised in, in and around the area. Um, and so, you know, we have, we have an affinity to this place that's different from someone that comes from the outside. And so, you know, we are the folks that know the people at the local schools because we went to the local schools, right? We are the people that know X business because we go and visit that business, right? And so similarly for government, you know, like the decisions they're making are affecting us and our families. And so um, for us as San Diego Valley residents, myself as an Almani, South Almani resident, you know, it's important uh, to continue building off those relationships uh, with government, with business, with other nonprofits, other CBOs. Because again, at the end of the day, um, there are a lot of needs in our community and we need to work together to be able to address them. And, and on, the, on the city side, they were super appreciative. Again, we sort of had the seed money to help them initiate the process. Um, so it was really great working with the city of South Monte uh, from the beginning because they really appreciated the help um, that, that we brought. And then throughout the whole process, we've always been there as sort of the support uh, foundation for the city for anything, whether it was community engagement, whether it was technical questions related to the design of the engineering of the project, or, you know, more, most importantly now, um, funding the actual construction, being there as sort of a resource for them whenever they had questions about a particular funding source or going through a particular application. Again, we're still there supporting the city and, and having that, that strong relationship with their staff has been uh, super important. And that relationship between the, the city and the CBO and our organization and, and Alta um, is, is, is integral to the design process as well, because we know that, again, as you mentioned, that they are going to be ultimately responsible for the, um, for the construction and what happens in that public space. Um, and then what happens after it's constructed in terms of the maintenance and making sure that it's, it's, it's performing over the long term. And so that takes me to the design process. David shared with us uh, some of the community-driven education and engagement around the design process. We know that we've, we need the funding to be there in order to carry that all the way through, but we also need the design team. And that takes us to James and, the, and his perspective of how this project has evolved through each of those different phases, um, the initial conception, through the design and into the construction as we're looking at moving into soon. And so James, I'm gonna ask you to kind of lead us off in terms of helping us understand what's been unique about this design process. And then I have a, a question for you at the end. And I hope we have time for it. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, what was, what was really unique about this design process was just that the project was just as well grounded in the community as we've been discussing so far. It really, you know, we walked into a very receptive community in a community that was ready to go further than anything they've really they had really seen up until that point. So, you know, at Alta, we were lucky enough to be part of the original planning efforts. But when doing that regional bike master plan, you know, you, you could see the way the city gradually opened up to the idea. So in the regional bike master plan, this corridor was identified as a class two bike facility. It was a bike lane. Um, it was going to be paint on the street, you know, best case scenario, paint on the street with a little buffer separating you from traffic. 
Um, and where we ended up with was essentially a trail through a, through a neighborhood. Um, and it was incredible to, to go through that process and to see the city and the community's willingness to just keep taking it further. And, and we kept coming up with other ways that they could take it further. You know, like we, we wanna maximize the, the, the cooling benefits of the project and we want our trees to get really big. So we integrated structural tree root vaults into the, into the project so that the trees would be able to grow into non-compacted soil under the bikeway. So the trees can share soil amongst each other. So we'll have much larger, happier trees as a result of that. The trees can actually extend their roots under the bikeway into adjacent properties. So they can really get much larger than they would have normally in a, in a typical parkway. Um, we also were able to um, integrate other stormwater related technologies that only enhance the landscape. So instead of that painted buffer, we had infiltration galleries built under, under the street. But in order to get the water into those infiltration galleries, we had permeable pavers in the parking lane. And next to that, a landscaped area that had native landscaping, the, the sort of plants that would have been growing in this neighborhood before any of this was built, before, the, before this road existed. Um, so we're putting some of those plants back in and those plants are sitting on top of those infiltration galleries. They're helping clean that water before it in, enters the, enter the, those infiltration chambers. And then that water is entered back into, uh, into the groundwater table. This is also helping keep clean water out of larger catch basins um, and detention basins um, at Whittier Narrows Park, just south of the project. There's a lake down there that, that takes some of this street runoff. And the more that we can clean that runoff before it hits that lake, the cleaner that lake is, and the more of a community resource that is. Um, so that's, it's just been an, you know, an incredible process to see how far and how many different ways the community has been willing to, um, to take this project forward further. As we worked with Active San Gabriel Valley on the outreach portions of the project, the, uh, the reception was, um, was pretty fantastic through most of the project and, and folks were, were willing to see something transformative in their communities. And, and I think a lot of that was because that trust was built from the outset. Like we were building something for this neighborhood. Um, it, was, it wasn't really, we weren't building something to try to get commuters from a neighborhood to, on one side of the, the project to a neighborhood on the other side of the project. We're building something that's an asset for the community right where we're building it. And that was another thing that it influenced the design itself because we've got a neighborhood full of families. Um, we've got a senior center down a block away from the project in one direction. We've got city hall, a library, an elementary school, all of these things that people would love to be able to walk to safely and comfortably. Um, but you know, when you can see tire tracks and donuts in every intersection and you start talking to folks who are living there now, they, they don't feel safe doing that. When, when speeding is a real problem down these roadways that were, you know, these, you've got a 60 foot span of asphalt from one side of the street to the other. There's a lot of wiggle room, people just floor it. So as we're able to start taking some of that space back and really giving it back to the community and making it more of an asset, um, you know, it really is providing that safer experience that folks were after here. The, the, the community engagement piece of this, uh, the, the, the community engagement for this project has been substantial as David has shared with us. And one thing that I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that we share is how, you know, how that helped to influence the design. What of that feedback and input was most valuable and how did that help to inform the design process? And how did you kind of come back and, and look at it maybe even after the fact? Well, it kind of, it, it really informed most aspects of it. You know, there were there were portions of the street that would flood every time it rained, and people were concerned about that, and they were excited that we could help fix that through the design. But you could also see through people's front yards where it abutted the street, there were beautiful gardens in parts of this project area. You know, there were. were Right out front, you could tell people cared about the landscape that they had access to, um, you know, the, their their own yards, and they took really great care of that. And they were really excited to see more of that. They wanted to see more landscape in their neighborhood. They wanted to have more shade and more trees. You know, we got a lot of feedback that it was hot, like the, it was, you know, it didn't feel particularly safe. But also, um, just to walk for a mile on the sidewalk out there, nine months out of the year, it might be over 90 degrees. It's hot. So we need some shade out there. Um, so folks are really excited about that. And, you know, we 
at our events, we talk to folks who walk around the neighborhood with strollers and they just, they're getting out with their kids and they want to be able to do that. But, you know, there might be a missing curb ramp here. You might be too close to the, to the traffic over here. The sidewalk might be too narrow in other places to even get your stroller past it. Um, so those were all elements that we were fixing as part of this project as well and making sure that you, know, you had that wider, you had enough sidewalk space to get around comfortably, you wouldn't get stuck, you wouldn't have to step into traffic. Um, you know, we also just witnessed being out in the, in the neighborhood, um, folks riding bikes around. There were people riding bikes in this neighborhood, but they were almost always on the sidewalk. You know, it was just, it just didn't feel safe in the street there. Um, the, that tr the traffic speeds were too fast. So we were able to, to help incorporate all of that into the design. And, and on that point, I want to get back to um, the, the, you know, how, how the Greenway is sort of functioning in, in a way that we would normally think of a trail um, out in maybe more of a, of a wildland urban interface or even in a much more natural setting. But here we are in the middle of an urban landscape. And we are very close to another, you know, body of water, with your narrows. And so maybe for David and James, in terms of the design process, um, how have you know have, have have we achieved what we intend to do in terms of creating and expanding the definition of what a trail or a green greenway could be? And if not, how might we do that kind of going forward? Well, what's great in this process is that still working in the San Gabriel Valley and that greenway network that the San Gabriel Valley is slowly building out will be this incredible network of trails built along waterways all through the region. But a project like this helps you get to those trails in the first place, but it's taking a lot of those same design approaches. Like I'm, I'm traditionally more of a trail designer um, and through this partnership with Tetra Tech on this project too, it was this, this great ability for, for to sort of bring traditional trail design elements that, that you find on the surface and have them work with subsurface technologies that are really encouraging that, um, that design and that process, but also making it extremely functional. So you end up with something that's very much like a trail on top, but it's also um, a pretty highly engineered landscape at the same time that's able to bring all these other benefits to the project. Yeah, and I, and I would just add <clears throat> that we are changing the, the face of Merced Avenue and that immediate landscape forever once constructed. I, I think the, the impact of this project is gonna be, is gonna be beautiful you know, for community uh, because on the, the Southern and the Northern end, the boundary of the city of South Almani, you have this awesome greenway, but then on in the Almani side and the Almani boundary of Merced Avenue, they're right now talking and designing and concept planning around creating a linear park on Merced Avenue. So from the Northern end, there's gonna be a park, a linear park, the first of its kind, maybe in the San Gabriel Valley. I haven't seen a linear park anywhere else in the San Gabriel Valley. And then you'll have the South Almani end be the greenway that we've been discussing and one of the intersection points or the, one of the corridors that it traverses is Rush. And we are currently working with the city of South Almani to redesign Rush. And Rush is primarily industrial commercial. And so, but the Rush corridor will connect you um, on one end to the Rio Hondo River. And on the other end, if you take Rush all the way down into Parkway Drive, it'll connect you to San, the San Gabriel River. So, you know, really, you know, Merced Avenue is creating this awesome, you know, trail system for people to be able to access these great places, Whittier Narrows, the Linear Park, Rio Hondo, San Gabriel, um, in their community without having to be car reliant. So we're really excited about that. Well, in, in the network that you're describing reminds me of, of how we often think of our, our streets. Uh, within the Council for Watershed Health, we look at sort of the natural systems and the urban systems. And we look at how those two inter intersect. And when we look at the LA River or the San Gabriel River, it, it has its own tributaries. And those tributaries are in a natural state, but there are also urban tributaries, which is sort of like the, the function of our streets. They function sort of as streams. And what you're describing is not only a trail 
um, and a network for active transportation, but also a network for managing stormwater runoff before it gets into those water bodies where they're impaired or there's there or or they shouldn't be um, impaired. And so the features that are are evident in Merced Avenue and that are kind of leading to or informing other design processes is helping us kind of manage that stormwater runoff in a much more natural way or mimicking that natural process, um, which has its own benefits. And then that's what's exciting for us to see sort of these multiple benefits come from managing the water and matching it up either from, you know, from a community perspective or, you know, at the larger scale at the water watershed perspective. Yeah. And yeah, please. Yeah, and then the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll add because I know this is a this has been a discussion in and around the LA County area around displacement, you know, with respect to greenway infrastructure or bike infrastructure, any type of infrastructure being there as part of our work. Um, we have been considering anti-displacement principles um, for the car, well, for the rush corridor planning. We're specifically looking at anti-displacement measures to take to make sure that. You know, what we're building now is to serve the people that are there now, not to serve others or outsiders. So I just wanted to uplift that. Anti-displacement has been top of mind for us and making sure that we're building something for the residents of South Amani there currently and, and, not, um, and not displacing them due to this greenway infrastructure that's coming up. Coming up. Thank you, David. That's such an important aspect of the, of the project work because there's always that element that somebody else will benefit from the hard work that others have been have been deserving of and have been working toward and and then it just reinforces the need to continue to make those connections to those other um, those other recreational be they passive or active recreation um, um, opportunities through our parks and our open space and I think that's one thing that we've learned from Merced Avenue that you can have an urban space and it can and, and it be an important connector to those um, th th those green spaces, those greenways, those, that open space. And we, we need so many more of those. And so I kind of want to open it up to either Cass or, or James or, or you, David, to you know, comment on how we might need to be thinking about that going forward. And maybe there's a lesson learned from Merced Avenue or any of the other projects you've worked on that we need to keep in mind and um, a way of closing up the conversation for now. Well, one more element I would bring up is how David mentioned in neighboring El Monte now, you know, we've got other jurisdictions being inspired by basically just being inspired by the previous project. And, you know, they want, they want to have the cooler project now. It's like, it's more a matter of like, let's see how much further we can take it. But then when you turn your, and the, the El Monte project was the same thing. It was going to be paint and some plastic posts. And that was it. And now it's a linear park. It's a full, it will, it will become a full blown park. So now not only have they expanded their benefits to now include open space, recreation, you know, more habitat areas, play spaces, fitness stations, like they, there's room for all of this in the, in a median, <laughs> you know, the street is so wide. There's actually room for all of this, but also from a funding perspective, now they've, they're creating a trail. It's, it's a trail at this point. It's fully surrounded by the landscape. It's a park, so they can go for park funding. They, they've, they just keep stacking on the ways that they can make these projects happen. And, and again, it's, just, it's a neighborhood that has very little park space and very little available space to even make new parks. But when you start being able to fit them into even the roadway here, you really start increasing that. And, and especially when these, these roadways really are this wide, there's enough room to do that all safely. You, you've, you're still well separated from traffic. Um, and another key part of this was um, not just creating these in connecting directly to trails and parks, but also making sure that we're making those connections to transit that can then get us to parks, which is another big factor in LA County. And I know other urbanized areas throughout California is just how to get folks to, to parks, how to get people out to trails that aren't in the middle of the city um, without having to jump in your car for an hour. Yeah, that's so important, not just having the active transportation opportunities, but being able to connect in other ways to those, uh, to that open space, and especially here and now, as we're, you know, fortunate to be thinking about moving out of the COVID situation, where so many people have been kind of hunkered down at home, and 
is that starts to become a little bit more accessible just because it's it's hopefully safer to do so. We're going to see a lot more need for that to happen because we all need to be out in the fresh air and exercising and, and connecting with nature and and each other. Um, we kind of want to make sure, Cass, do you have any any closing thought at this point? I would just sort of going off of what James was saying regarding, you know, connecting this larger network into some of the, the, the larger transit transit hubs that we uh, have. Um, there's a lot of effort building connections from those transit hubs up into the forest. I know Nature for All has looked at um, opportunities to create uh, shuttles, shuttle schedules that brings people up into the forest. So they get to those natural trails or the trailheads um, with it across the forest. Um, so if we can get folks safely to those transit hubs, we have other CBOs and nonprofits working at getting residents from those hubs up into the actual open space safely and without the need for a car. Yeah, just again, just reinforcing the, the need for access to the trails via greenways, via the urban or um, natural um, trailheads is, is so important. And I guess, you know, we're kind of closing in on our, our time limit here for now. So, David, is there any last closing comment that you'd like to add? Yeah, from a community engagement perspective, it's it's really important um, to be able to work alongside communities, center community engagement, make sure that you're providing equitable access for folks and to, you know, take that frame or understanding of equity, like investing in the folks that need, need the resources the most. And as part of that, you know, I would say uh, plan, plan a 10 year schedule, you know, to the best of your ability, because these projects will not, even though you really want them to, they will not get built overnight. Um, and so you need to be persistent, you know, ongoing, on an ongoing basis. And so uh, really it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of hard work and being persistent and keeping, keep, keeping the elected officials or decision makers accountable to make sure that the project that you care about, projects that you care about, keep moving along. So um, whatever project you want right now, just plan for it to be built in 2031, you know, so just think about it that way. And we got to and we got to keep planning. We got to start now to plan and, and plan out, you know, for the next ten years. Um, so with that, thank you, David, for sharing your perspective, and Cass for sharing your knowledge and your experience, and, and James for sharing your perspective and your and your um, and your lessons learned from this process. And to all of you, we look forward to taking your questions, and we'll we'll see you soon.